Hi, this is uh, part three in a series of lectures by the Functional Movement and Fitness Corporation, or Cease Health. It's on why is there so little relief from musculoskeletal problems. This is part three on neuromuscular and neurosensory dysfunction. These lectures are educational and not intended to manage individual patients. They are not a substitute for patients seeing healthcare professionals. Among the reasons are patients vary and no brief presentation substitutes for formal training. Uh, among the things we would like to achieve is increased function with age, non-surgical injury restoration, injury prevention, and fitness. It is inconceivable that someone would work with musculoskeletal disorders without a strong working knowledge of neurology. I'm fortunate and would like to thank having worked with Marty Samuels and Alan Roper at Brigham and Women's, the authors of Principles of Neurology, along with Robert Schwartzman from Philadelphia, all world-respected um, neurologists. So I'd like to get, discuss four aspects of uh, the neurology of musculoskeletal pathologies. The central nervous system, neuromuscular control, neuromuscular dysfunction, and then proprioception and kinesthesia. So again, my name is Mark Brzezinski, and my background can be found on the web page on the web page and in previous uh, presentations. So I'd like to begin with the central nervous system. And the central nervous system is so often not accounted for when people have musculoskeletal problems, but it's critical. And we start, for the most part, with the central nervous system. And just looking at it in general, we look at the cortex, because if there's problems with the cortex, or we'll just in general, view the cortex as consciousness, then you're going to have problems with rehabilitation assessment. But we look at th specifically at things like sequencing. So someone needs to be able to remember sequences in order for them to learn or regain function. It's also the way you learn abnormal function. And these sequences and that could even include anything from gait to a golf swing, are imprinted on the brain stem, generally the basal ganglion, and coordinated with the cerebellum. So just using ankle sprains as an example, um, ankle sprains generally reoccurred or roughly, lateral ankle sprains are roughly at a rate of 70%. But the rate is the same in both ankles, and studies now for well over a decade um, suggest that this is a higher order problem, that this is actually a problem in the brain. And so from this study, which I encourage people to read because I'm only going to give a, a brief blurb, uh, modifications in global motor strategies were found in participants with lateral leg ankle sprains, as well as decreased performance on both the injured and uninjured limbs. So the problem in performance was found on both sides. These results support the hypothesis that following lateral, following lateral ankle sprains, there may be a, a maladaptation reorganization of central motor commands. Changes generally in the basal ganglion or in similar structures. So other tests we look at for higher motor function and disturbances in higher motor function can be anything from early ASL, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, environmental factors, toxins, viral drugs, uh, progressive uh, bulbar, bulbar palsy. And so an example test we would use is a uh, pronator drift. And I think in the exam video I called it a supernator drift. But it's looking for the inhibitory function that naturally occurs in um, uh, 
from the upper motor neurons on the lower motor neurons. And so if you've got a problem with these inhibitory functions um, that should be taking place, then you will um, have, it's going to be challenging for both assessment and rehabilitation. And it's important to understand the different tracks of the uh, spinal cord, which is also the central nervous system, the posterior tract, which is now more commonly referred to as the dorsal tract, has uh, deep touch proprioception and vibration. And we take advantage of the fact proprioception and vibration are carried in the same tract because we will often use low frequency tuning forks at 128 hertz or uh, even lower frequencies to test to give us an idea of how the uh, posterior tract is doing, but this is often disturbed, for example, in B12 deficiency. Um, the muscles are controlled by the cortical spinal tract, which is in different, uh, in two, at least two different locations. Uh, the lateral spinal thalamic tract deals with sharp pain and thermal sensation, and the ventral spinal thalamic tract deals with light touch. And so you could see that um, it gives us indications if there's spinal stenosis, discs, or a problem in the cord. Uh, it could indicate potential problems like a tumor, uh, fracture, or other etiologies. And so it's important to understand that in, in this particular one, the grayish area is really the white matter in the cord and the reddish area is the gray matter or the neurons. So neuromuscular control. Probably the best example of neuromuscular control is the shoulder, uh, particularly the glenohumeral joint. So we like to think of the glenohumeral joint as being uh, structurally stable, like a golf ball on a tee. But that's absolutely not the case. It's more like an elephant on a ball. Muscles are uh, isometrically, concentrically, or eccentrically contracting very finely to keep the glenohumeral joint in place. And so um, if that fine neuromuscular control doesn't exist, then we'll actually get rocking within uh, the joint, and you can have damage to structures like the labrum, the capsule, or other injuries, and so find control. And a lot of groups are working now on, particularly in the Midwest, on dynamic stabilization, which is critical for the shoulder. It's also important for other joints, but I think the joint, the shoulder joint, is the most representative. But in other major areas, in a large First, the shoulder is also stabilized to the axial skeleton. And it's stabilized to the axial skeleton by the rhomboids, but also by the trapezius and serratus anterior. And very commonly we see paralysis of serratus anterior here by the lower blue arrow. And the reason why that's important is serratus anterior is critical in rotation of the scapula. And when you lift your arm over your head, one third of that rotation is scapular rotation from serratus anterior. So when you have a paralyzed serratus anterior, and it's usually from paralysis of the long thoracic nerve, and we may go into more detail why the long thoracic nerve is so susceptible to injury in other lectures. But when that's injured, then uh, when you lift your arm over your head, you're actually jamming your humeral head into structures above, whether it's ligament or bony structures, and trapping the rotator cuff tendons. And so a large percentage of the people we see who have rotator cuff symptoms actually have problems in, um, uh, in between the shoulder blades or man controlling the scapula. And so the entire shoulder joint, the clavicle, the scapula, the glenohumeral joint, and 
the relationships through the rib have to be viewed as one. It's a shoulder complex. It, it, there isn't really a shoulder joint. They don't act independently. And the neuromuscular control of this joint is very important. Another area that's very critical is the hip and ankle, and I'm going to take the extreme case. You will often see in professional football, even an impact injury, and where the impact injury ultimately results in a knee injury, but the knee injury is caused by um, abnormal rotation or coordination between the ankle and hip. And in one example, I saw where the, uh, the player got it, the cleats released immediately, but in midair, the hip and the ankle uh, rotated at a different rate, and he literally tore his knee apart in midair. And so um, we'll work on things, uh, and people who work on in the short foot area, barefoot training area, have developed some techniques to improve coordination and there, uh, and there's parts of the exam to identify it. And a single leg squat is a great example. When somebody goes down on a single leg squat and their knee is all over the place, you know it's likely to be the source of their knee pain, not something anatomical. And so, um, uh, we focus in a, a lot on the rot external rotators of the hip and particularly tibialis posterior and because of their influence on the knee, particularly during gait. So neuromuscular dysfunction. And again, this goes into, I already explained this in the previous slides, but it's demonstrated here in the bottom right hand corner how when you fail to rotate the scapula you actually trap the rotator cuff. So I, people very often use the terms proprioception knowing where your limbs are in space and kinesthesia uh, knowing your movement in space um, in as the same thing, or I've actually oft heard people refer to uh, kinesthesia as a type of proprioception. And really, I think of uh, proprioception as knowing where your joints are in space. And that's a function very much of, for instance, the posterior column and the sens sensors in your joints on your skin, whereas kinesthesia is much more complicated and involves more of the central nervous system. But for now, uh, we'll stick with the fact that the same have the same definition. And an interesting example of where I see a lot of injuries that are likely proprioception related. And so giving an example, ACL tears. A lot of times it seems that the, the reason for the ACL tear is um, poor proprioception. So generally, for instance, in skiers or runners, I want them to be able to stand on one foot with their eyes closed for 20 seconds. And you'll often hear a skier or a runner say when they were injured, they were looking to the side. And the reason is that this is likely a proprioception injury is that if you can't stand on your one leg with your eyes closed for 10 to 20 seconds, you don't know where your limbs are in space. So when you turn your head, um, you will um, not know where your limbs are in space. You attempt to decelerate, and then the tibia and, f and femur move separately, and you tear the ACL. In this particular image, it's supposed to be ACL and PCL. And similarly, this is pretty common in runners, too. They'll tell you after the, an injury, whether it's a tibial band, an ankle sprain, suddenly they don't enjoy running anymore. They don't enjoy the scenery. And if you ask them to pay attention, you'll find out that they're looking at their feet because after the injury, um, they lose proprioception and they have to regain it again. And this is very common. We lose proprioception with even minor injuries, but it's very rap easy 
or generally easy to bring it back. And we favor, you know, starting barefoot, but also moving to shoes, but barefoot training too. And we'll talk about that in another lecture. Some of the training techniques to improve proprioception, not just getting on um, a half disc or th those large scale uh, type proprioception um, um, methods, but also fine tuning using rugs with abnormal surfaces uh, like doormats. So neurology is critical to under. This is a picture of Marblehead where we're located, and I thought I would just add a scenic view uh, where we're located. And um, neurology it can't be overemphasized, is critical in treating patients with musculoskeletal problems. We can't ignore it. And we go commonly back to the example of the patient with knee pain who gets an MRI that shows a meniscal study and then doesn't have dramatic relief after surgery. And when you do an exam, they just have poor control over their knees. The neurologic function is poor or the patient with rotator cuff pain who actually has problems with their scapula. And so many aspects of neuromuscular dysfunction, particularly in athletes, is due to neuromuscular control or sensation problems. And so, uh, and even pre-activation among, um, we didn't talk about in ankle sprains, the peroneal reaction isn't quick enough to, of the muscle, you know, the reflex arc isn't quick enough, for instance, if you step into a hole. And so pre-activation, being able to activate with your eyes is much faster or prepares you when you are going to enter, for instance, an uneven surface. And so these are all important components of... Um, training and rehabilitation processes. But the important point is you can't learn enough neurology. So um, thank you for listening. And again, these lectures are educational and not intended to manage individual patients. They are not a substitute for patients seeing healthcare professionals. Among the reasons our patients vary and no brief presentation substitutes for formal training. Thank you.